first speaker is Patrick Macy, a professor of musicology here at Eastman. And he works mainly in the Renaissance. He's best known for his work on uh, Savonarola and on especially Josquin des Prés. But he can occasionally be lured into the 17th century. And when that happens, it actually often involves uh, Frescobaldi. In fact, I managed to lure him to write about Frescobaldi for the Saunders Festschrift that was published in 1994, uh, in which he published an article called Fresca Frescobaldi's Musical Tributes to Ferrara. I think we'll hear something more about Ferrara today. So welcome, Patrick Macy. Thank you, Professor Schneider. It's a pleasure to be here and to uh, welcome all of our guests, especially our Italian visitors. A special uh, warm welcome to you. And today, I'll be talking about Frescobaldi and Ferrara, from vocal madrigal to keyboard toccata. And here we see an early portrait of Frescobaldi, native of Ferrara. The toccata is an improvisatory keyboard work with frequent changes of mood and musical material from rapid ornamental passages that lead to more regular, evenly paced segments. The rapid alternation of moods in the toccata is one of its central features and keeps the listener guessing about what will unfold. The toccatas of Girolamo Frescobaldi ravish the ear with innovative and virtuosic musical passages, and they stand among the most captivating musical creations of the early 1600s. It happens that rapid changes of emotional affect constitute the heart and soul of the Italian madrigal in the 1500s. And these shifts are responses to the vivid psychological states expressed by the words. The person in love experiences extremes of emotion, from exaltation to doubt, from hope to dread. The lover's fate lies in the hands of the beloved. And we all know that song, Will You Still Love Me Tomorrow? <laughs> The Italian madrigal developed various musical means to express shifts of mood, as we shall see. But first, a bit of background on Frescobaldi and Ferrara is in order. Girolamo Frescobaldi was born in Ferrara in 1583, at a time when the court of the Este Dukes flourished and cultivated lavish musical entertainments, especially evenings devoted to performance of madrigals by virtuoso singers. And here we see the fortress of the Este Dukes. There are actually very elaborate uh, frescoed halls inside, perfect for uh, performing music. And you can see here's the fortress at the front, and at the back, the palace itself is quite extensive. It's a couple of wings here, so with more rooms for appropriate for performing music. Ferrara is just south of Venice. It's in the Po River Valley, so it's very flat. Great place to ride a bicycle. And it enjoyed a long tradition as a center of avant-garde art, music, and literature. The Dukes employed painters such as Titian and poets such as Ludovico Ariosto and Torquato Tasso. They were especially devoted to music and offered patronage to famous composers of madrigals, including Adrian Villert, Cipriano de Rore, and Luzzasco Luzzaschi. It's one of my favorite names of the Renaissance. <laughs> and the last patron, Duke Alfonso II, was the last Duke of Ferrara. He had no male heirs, and so Ferrara devolved to the papacy. It became part of the Pope's uh, papal states. Frescobaldi played a major role in carrying on this avant-garde tradition especially in his music for the harpsichord and organ. And here we see the uh, title page engraving uh, is from 1619. And he received his musical training in Ferrara when the court was dissolved in 1597 after the death of the last duke. He transferred from the sophisticated court to the cosmopolitan and competitive environment of Rome, where he rapidly rose to fame as the organist of St. Peter's Basilica. Frescobaldi paid honor to his home city of Ferrara 
in his publication of Capriccios. And here we have the dedication to Don Alfonso, who was in Modena. He says, I owe to your highness as to a prince who by birth retains from his ancestors the ancient and hereditary protection of the fine arts, the fruit of those musical efforts to which I gave myself in my first years in Ferrara under the teaching of Signor Luzzasco, so rare an organist and so dear a servant of the most serene house of Este. That house has been the most celebrated and sure stronghold of virtuosi in Italy, and its glory has drawn the homage of the immortal pens of Ferrarese writers. So Frescobaldi received his musical training in Ferrara, and when the court dissolved, which we saw, he went to Rome. He paid honor in this uh, uh, preface, and at the age of 28, he published his first book of Toccatas in Rome, and the book went through two new editions within a year. The early editions specify that the works are for performance on the harpsichord di cimbalo, and by the time the fifth edition appeared, some 20 years later, the title page expanded the subtitle and said it's suitable for both harpsichord and organ, cimbalo et organo. The process for printing the Toccatas was expensive. This required engraving the music on copper plates, which were then run through the printing press. The procedure allowed the engraver to capture the freely flowing scales and quick shifts of texture, as can be seen in the reproduction. The rapid ornaments start high in the register, swoop down to the low bass notes, and then sail back to the top, all in nervous swirls of motion. And we will focus today on the Toccata Terza, the third Toccata and similar ornaments starting high, moving down into the bass register and back high again. So now we want to turn to the aesthetic of the madrigal. And Cardinal Pietro Bembo is the central figure. He is a literary theorist, and he especially emphasizes the notion of antithesis, or opposites of words, in his treatise, Writings on Vernacular Language. He promoted the poetry of Petrarch as a model for Italian language and poetry. And there's a portrait of Bembo by Titian. You were nobody unless you had your portrait painted by Titian in the 16th century. <laughs> and so this notion of antithesis, the central uh, idea of the madrigal, we have this contrast of emotional states, as we mentioned, hope, despair, joy, sorrow, hot, cold, and often the texts say, I burn, I freeze. So that's a common trope. In the antithesis of words, the actual sound of the word is essential. So hard words use consonants and hard consonants. So the Italian aspro is, means harsh, and cruda means cruel. It sounds harsh. And soft words use the soft vowels. So umile, focus on vowels, humble, very soft sounding. So the word sounds correlate to the meanings of the words. And we see this, and this is an example used by um, Bembo uh, to illustrate these uh, opposites, antithesis. Petrarch's sonnet 265, set to music by Villert, and the first word happens to be aspro, and that is the harsh heart and untamed and cruel will of the lady. And the second line then shifts to the soft sounds, in dolce, umile, angelica, figura. So we get a real contrast within the first two lines of this sonnet. And when Villert um, comes to set this to music, he is going to emphasize the first line with hard sounds of major thirds, major sixths. Second line, minor thirds, minor sixths. So if we could have the first clip. It's very audible, the contrast. Um, maybe we could have just a little more volume on the, on the clips. 
And now we turn back again to Venus and uh, Titian and Venus and Adonis. Um, this was a famous uh, mythological scene. Many copies were made. And this illustrates uh, Adonis taking leave of Venus. They spent the night together. Um, you can see up here in the corner, the sun is rising, so this is the dawn. And Venus obviously doesn't want him to leave. She's holding on. Um, Cupid is asleep. He's sort of not doing his duty. And uh, Adonis is off to hunt the wild boar. What's going to happen to Adonis is that the boar is going to attack him and kill him, so he's not coming back. And Venus may have some premonition of that. And there is a sonnet which is very closely related to this scene and perhaps is even inspired by the Titian painting. It says, from the fair regions of the east, brightly and cheerfully rose the dawn, and I enjoyed in the arms of my divine goddess such joy that the human mind can't conceive it, when I heard after an ardent sigh. Hope of my heart, sweet desire, you go. Alas, you leave me alone. Farewell. What will happen to me, somber and sad? Ah, cruel love, uncertain and brief are your joys, for you take great delight when extreme happiness ends in tears. So we get a nice antithesis of happiness and tears at the end there. And so she is speaking first to Adonis, the, her lover, and then she turns to accuse Cupid of, of causing her unhappiness. And Cipriano de Rore sets this with shifting harmonies, especially to express the changing emotional state of the, of the lady. And you'll hear I may in the second line there. And at the end of the third line, an open harmony, it sounds like a question. And then she shifts into minor, very far away, and she, she accuses love of causing her unhappiness. So if we could hear this uh, clip. sweet part. We'll forgo the tears. And uh, as you were listening to that performance, I think you could hear them stretching out the tempo and then speeding up a little bit. Well, this is actually addressed by Nicola Vicentino, who also worked in Ferrara, worked with the Este. He wrote a treatise called Ancient Music Adapted to Modern Practice, published in 1555. He says, sometimes a composition is performed with changes in the beat, in keeping with the words, so as to express the effects of the passions. You will find that, in Italian madrigals, the procedure of varying the beat gratifies the listeners more than does a persistent, unvaried beat. So those performers had obviously read Vicentino. And then Frescobaldi, uh, let's see what he has to say. This is in the preface to his first book of Toccatas. He, he has an introduction to the reader. He says, I am well aware of the current fashion for performing with a variety of emotions by placing song-like effects in contrast with fast passages. To show myself as favorable to this style as I am fond of it, I here present my feeble efforts to Toccatas in print. And then he goes on to be a little more specific. Here's the first recommendation. This manner of playing Toccatas must not remain subject to a beat, as we can see in modern madrigals. Although difficult, this madrigal style is facilitated by means of the beat, taking it now slowly, now rapidly, and even suspending the beat in the air, according to the meaning of the words. So Frescobaldi, having worked with madrigalists in Ferrara, is very familiar with this style. 
And I'd like to hear just this little passage of, you are going, and then when they say, alas, you'll hear them stretch the, stretch the beat out. And then listen for the bass at the end. That's an extraordinary interval, a minor seventh, leap, uh, leaping down. And it's the way in Italian you would say the word, I may. You start high and you go down. So it's like a speaking voice. So if we could hear the next clip. Do you hear the bass? A little portamento helps. And then we have the opening of Frescobaldi's Toccata III. And I think it's interesting to see that he's also using these kinds of descending intervals from D down to F sharp. And there's a G in the bass, so that F sharp is going to sound quite dissonant. And I think that gesture may be partially inspired by this notion, I may comes over and over in the madrigals, and it's always some sort of descending, often strange interval, minor seventh, minor sixth is also very common. So if we could hear just the opening of this toccata. And maybe a little more volume on the, on, this, on the clips. And here's the opening four measures. We could hear this one. that minor seventh at the end, F down to G. Now let's go on to Luzzaschi, who was Frescobaldi's teacher. He um, composed madrigals for three virtuoso sopranos. The Duke was uh, a melomaniac. He listened to madrigals every day for several hours. And he loved elaborate ornamentation. So these are really highly trained singers. And one of the madrigals says, dear graceful eyes, beloved face, which love gave me so late. And, and Luzzaschi's gonna use slow rhythms there, suspensions. And fierce fate so quickly has taken away. So then we get faster rhythms for quickly. And then we get an echo effect. Live far from you, everything slows down. And they repeat that as an echo. And then, so close am I to the fatal end of my life that if I can return alive to you, I'll return immortal. So lots of chances to show contrast in this text. And if we could hear the uh, first clip, we'll hear the first two or uh, three lines. Pause a minute and just take a look. You can see for Tardo, you have these suspensions, slow rhythms, sort of dragging to the cadence. And then a fier destin quickly uh, has taken you away. We have fast rhythm and close entries for all three sopranos. And if we could hear the next clip, we'll have Vive Lungi da Voi.
That could have been a fatal ornament. <laughs> the sopranos go all the way up to high B flat there. And we can see, there's the Tanto Vicino, I'm so close, so we have close entries for the three sopranos. And then here's their elaborate ornamentation, two of them singing in, in very elaborate uh, passage work there. Now, all of these features, I think we can see echoes of in uh, Fresco Baldi's Toccata Terza. This dragging descent in uh, syncopations we see in bar five, where the top voice moves and then the bottom voice, top, bottom, and so forth, dragging into the cadence. And um, maybe we could hear this passage. And then he goes on in the next bar to have faster rhythms, 16ths in the bass, picking up and giving some contrast to that dragging passage that we just heard. And then following this is these uh, entries of song-like, uh, imitative, very close entries, very similar to the, to the uh, Lutsanski. And the tune is da 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 you must remember this, play it again, Sam. <laughs> You'll hear it, it's a tune. So this is the song-like part. So if you could hear this one. So that song-like passage gives way through this faster rhythm. It's the same motive, but now it's 16th, and then blossoms out into this, what I think of as an overflow of emotion. And you get these really extravagant uh, passages of 16th notes and wild ornaments. So the contained song-like passages then are contrasted with these overflow passages of fast figuration. And then Frescobaldi does passages in double um, ornamentation, he calls them passo doppio, and this is also reminiscent of those kinds of double ornamented passages that we heard in the uh, Lutsaski madrigal. So if we could hear this, it starts just a little bit before um, the example. So to sum up, a toccata is not a madrigal. A toccata has no words, but Frescobaldi was intimately acquainted with the aesthetic of the madrigal and its use of antithesis to express rapid shifts of emotion. This aesthetic provided a model for the toccata, and those who perform and listen to keyboard toccatas will gain a greater understanding and appreciation of this genre if they are aware of the expressive features and extremes of emotion that form the heart and soul of the madrigal. Thank you. started.
start with the sure. question. I'm, I'm fascinated by the fact that uh, this third toccata from the first book is the one that we heard Jacob Dasa play this morning at the master class on the organ. Uh -huh. And you mentioned that um, in the fifth production, fifth edition of this book of toccatas, he uh, changed it from harpsichord mm -hmm to harpsichord and organ. And I wonder if you have any comments about the, uh, was that just a marketing ploy? Do these work better on the harpsichord than on the organ? Or what's going on here? Certainly partly uh, marketing. You want to sell copies. You want to reach the widest market. But uh, I would put the question back to the student who played the Takata on the organ. What's, uh, what kinds of adjustments does one have to make? I unfortunately didn't get to hear that class. So yeah. if they're Are you here, here? Oh, yeah, we call yes. here. Hello. You want to say something? Um, having played this on both harpsichord and organ, I will say um, a lot of the toccatas from the first book definitely are more idiomatic to the harpsichord. But toccata terza, I think, and a few others um, do work quite nicely on the organ. Um, I think one of the reasons this one works really nicely on the organ is you have a lot of sustained chords over a lot of time, especially that like that pulling passion passage we had with all the suspensions works really nicely. Something we have to worry about is on the harpsichord, um, while the notes die away on the organ, that does not happen, of course. Um, you have to compensate for that. Uh, so on the harpsichord, you might have to re-strike the suspensions in order to keep the yes. distance alive. Yeah, that makes sense. The sustaining power of the organ can bring out other features that the decay of the harpsichord is maybe a little more difficult to. You don't want to have an empty, empty sound, as Professor Balby says. Yeah. Anything else? Other questions? Comments? Okay, let's thank Patrick once again.